Well, let's get our Bible and turn them to the New Testament. In this letter that we have been learning from, if you remember, before we celebrated the resurrection of the Lord last week, we were learning from Romans. We started in chapter 12. We finished that and uh, finished chapter 13, and now we're in chapter 14. And so, turn to Romans chapter 14, and we'll read from verse 1 to 13. And if you're able to stand, please stand as we honor God in the reading of His Word. And even though you are those in live stream, you're at home, you can also stand as we honor the Lord in the reading of His Word. In Romans chapter 14, starting on verse 1, it reads, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord he does not eat, and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt to your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Let us pray. Our loving Lord, we come before you to honor you once again and to worship you, even as your people, the redeemed. You have redeemed us with your precious blood and brought us into your presence. And even together in the body of Christ, the church. And as we continue, Lord God, to learn of your truths, your word, even this morning, we thank you as we have sung for the Holy Spirit that you have filled us with, even now. And it is your Holy Spirit that we uh, ask that uh, give us the understanding and also the enabling of your word in our lives and through us. So that, Lord, even as a church family, not only in Sunday morning worship services, but every day, that we will grow both in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, and that the power and the reality of your word in our lives will be a testimony even to the lost, that people may see the truth and reality of Jesus Christ and the word that we share to them, so that they too may come to the saving knowledge of the Lord. And once again, we thank you, and we ask all this in the most precious name, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may all be seated. There's uh, our brother, Brian. We haven't seen him for decades. <laughs> Good to see you. The title for this morning's message is Don't Be Judgmental. This is not a game. There's a Philippine, there, in the Philippines, there is this uh, portion of the game show called Bawal Ang Judgmental. 
Okay? It's interesting that even non-Christians understand this terminology. So today we will address a very important matter, so critical that if we don't know it, and more importantly, if we don't abide by the biblical teaching or principle that addresses this matter, we will ruin our fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ. It will break the unity the Lord prayed for in His high priestly prayer and established for us. And the unity that he brought us into, which is his church, the body, the body of Christ. Imagine the body of Christ being divided or separated. I don't think anyone who loves Jesus and acknowledges him as Lord really want to do that. I mean, we don't want that for ourselves. We don't want our body to be dismembered and separated from each other. How much more the body of Christ? which is, again, the church, his church, not yours, not mine. It's his. So let us listen and learn, and more importantly, follow. Abide by God's principles regarding this matter in preserving the unity in our fellowship, even this church family. We are not a big church, but regardless of the size of a congregation, we are all the same or equal, in the sense that we were all sinners, saved by the mercy of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all recipients of God's amazing grace. Jesus Christ died for us all. He paid for all our sins. And having said that, we still need to understand that we are different from one another in many ways. We have differences. And what the Lord wants us to do with our difference is what we will address this morning. We all come from different backgrounds, different upbringing that formed our view in life, shaped our characters, influenced our personalities. Some come from a background where God was never mentioned or believed. Jesus, perhaps, was not even known. Spiritual matters are unimportant so that you didn't really go to a church service growing up, or you hardly went to church services. Some come from a background where you went to church all your life. And growing up, you have acquired or adopted traditions that you live by. Your point of view, your beliefs, your convictions, or your pattern of thought is very much influenced by it. And just a reminder, tradition is one of the hardest strongholds for us to break in our lives. Some people never do break from it. So when we gather people coming from different backgrounds or different upbringing, different traditions, different convictions, different points of views or opinions, we bring these people together and you know what is bound to happen. Friction, criticisms, judgments, condemnation, arguments, division. These are bound to happen to any group for that matter. It even happens to our families and relatives. And sad to say, even in the church family. But it doesn't have to be. Because as a church, a body or a group of believers that follow Jesus, the children of God, brothers and sisters in the Lord, we have God's Word and the Holy Spirit of God that uses His Word to correct us, instruct us, teach us, empower us to live according to His Word, His truth, His righteousness. So that even though we may have differences, we can overcome those differences. We can be together in unity, in harmony, with peace and joy and love. But that is much, that is very much dependent on our recognition of who Jesus is, our humbling before Him, and respect or submit to His authority over us all. Who is Jesus? Jesus is Lord. That's where we begin. Let us be sure that we acknowledge Him for who He is in our lives. 
if we are to live in the unity of His love and in the beauty of His holiness. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. And once we truly acknowledge Him for who He is, then we will submit to what He says. Nothing else and no one else. Otherwise, we will disrespect the Lord. We disrespect the Lord and do not acknowledge His authority when we listen and pursue our opinions or views instead of God's Word. When we do that, troubles begin. Listen, the Lord Jesus is our primary and final authority, and His Word is authoritative. Of course, the Lord has representatives here on earth or ministers. And as long as those ministers speak according to the Bible, then we listen. But if what they say are just opinions, human philosophy, traditions, personal views, personal rules, they are not authoritative. We really don't have to listen. And so this morning, what we have is a minister of the Lord, a representative of Jesus, whose name is the Apostle Paul, used by the Lord to speak and address this matter of differences in the church and how we are to deal with our differences together. In the early church, just as the church in Rome, there were Gentiles and then there were the Jews. The Gentiles, as you know, were pagans. They had many other gods, idols. Part of their idol worship is offering food to their gods. But a number of them became Christians, believers of the Lord Jesus, and they understood and realized that only Jesus is the true and living God. That idols are nothing. And food sacrificed to idols have no spiritual bearing. And so in the early church were Gentiles who came from that background. Then there were the Jews. The, Jew, the Jews had many strict laws and rituals and ceremonies, traditions, practices that adhere, that they adhere to or observe which are, you know, man-made rules. And many of those have practices, have become strong convictions or beliefs. Many of those practices have become strong convictions or beliefs. But just, just like the Gentiles, many of the Jews also became Christians, believers of Jesus as their Messiah. And so the early church were made up of these two groups, one coming from a loose background of paganism, while the other group coming from a strict background of traditions. Needless to say, the early church had differences among them and the result, and it resulted really in criticism, condemnation, disagreements, debates, members being judgmental of other members. But thank God, really no division in the sense that were members divided and left. Instead, the ministers of God, like the Apostle Paul, address the matter, the issue with God's word, and the church members listened. And that's what we need to do. Listen and obey to the word of the Lord. Not our opinions or views, not our reasonings, not how we feel about the matter, but the word of the Lord. Remember, we live by faith and not by sight. Now, with the church in Rome, there are differences that they had issues about, among many other things, boiled down to two things, food and the observance of holy days. In other words, the differences that they were making issues about were really non-essential matters. It's one thing to disagree and even divide or separate over essential matters of the faith. And it's another thing to argue and leave a fellowship over non-essential matters. Essential matters are doctrines of the Bible that we need to be firm and stay united and never divide on. Essential matters are teachings that are not up for debate. These matters are not debatable. They're not disputable. In other words, there is no debating about such matters because... The Bible is clear and specific on these matters. 
We as a church cannot have differences on these essential matters. God in His, God in His Word does not allow us to divide on essential matters. We must have a solid unity on the essential things. Otherwise, we really cannot be together as one. We draw the line. We divide. We separate if we have differences on essential matters. What are the essential matters or teachings? The teachings about God, the doctrine of God, the nature of God, the teaching about Jesus Christ, about the Holy Spirit, about man, about sin, about salvation, about heaven, about hell. That there is one God in three persons and that He is holy, holy, holy. Man is a sinner, sinful and falls short of the glory of God. Sin, remember, is anything the Bible calls sin such as sexual immorality, murder, lying, stealing, unbelief, and whatever the Bible categorically or specifically calls sin. There is no debating. And because sin, and because of sin rather, man is separated from holy God. Therefore, man cannot save himself. And Jesus is the only Savior, the only way, the only truth, the one true life. So that salvation is in Christ alone, by His grace alone, through faith alone. These are major things or essential things. If you think differently, I cannot unite with you. Neither should you if you're a true believer and follower of Christ. And again, there is no debating on these matters because the Bible is crystal clear precise, exacting, so that, there, so that we are to make sure that we are solid on these. They are essential because, listen, essential things have an effect on your eternal destiny depending on what you believe and what you do about them. Non-essential things, on the other hand, are things that do not have an effect on your eternal destiny, whether you do them or do not do them. For example, is what we have in our text in Romans 14. Foods, days, and of servants of holy days. These two things just represent non-essential issues. They represent disputable or debatable matters. Matters that the Bible allows for us to have differences on. To have differences in the belief and in the practice of them some of which are based on our opinions, point of view, because of our upbringing or traditions that we grew up in. These are things that the Bible does not categorically or specifically calls sin. They are non-essentials. They are debatable. You can have your personal belief and practice on that matter. I can have my own. Again, the example is what we have in our text. So back to our text, in a pagan culture such as Rome, it was their lifestyle to offer animal sacrifice to their gods in temples and then take the leftover meat and sell it in the marketplaces. Now for the Gentiles who became Christians and are now in the church, they had no issue with that, eating meat sacrificed to idols. For them, it was just food. They gave thanks to God and enjoyed their steak. Some well done, some medium rare, some very rare. It didn't have, they understood it, that it didn't have any spiritual bearing or meaning for them. But for the Jews, on the other hand, who are Christians and were part of the church, that was too close to idol worship. Many of them equated it actually to, with idolatry and it was offensive. Besides that, Jews had many other dietary restrictions and therefore many of them ate only vegetables. They also had a Sabbath law where they worship God on Sabbath the, and only on Sabbath. So there in the early church, made up of Jews and Gentiles, there was this contentious situation that endangered the unity in the fellowship of the church. But even today, 
in the modern church, there are similar situations whose issues really are not about the essential matters, but are about the non-essential matters. Churches even today fight over such non-essential matters, such as what? Such as almost everything. From the food we eat, what we can drink or not drink. Should we have drums in the church or just a piano or organ? Can we sing choruses or hymns? Choirs or no choirs? With robes or no robes? How about the light? Colored lights, big screens, monitors. How about wearing a coat in time for the men and dress for women? Can a pastor work a secular job at the same time or not? Or how about the rapture? Whether the rapture happens before the tribulation, the middle of it, or after the tribulation. And the list goes on. You get the point. And that is what has been happening from the early church even now to our present time, even in the morning church. And you often see these arguments in board meetings. And thank God, not really in our church board. We have been blessed with a good church board, not only today, but in the past. Listen, there will always be people that you don't agree with on certain issues. These people may sit beside you, in front of you, behind you, and you're good with them. Say hi, hello every Sunday morning. And you're good with all these with them all this time, until you find out your differences. Then you become judgmental, critical. Some, they don't become judgmental, they just become mental. But what does the Lord have to say, you see? What does the Lord have to say regarding this issue in the church, including us today? Romans 14. For the most part, it's really easy to understand. Really does not need much explaining, just a little bit, if ever. Because just like a parent, when children are arguing or fighting, the parent says easy things to understand, easy words and practical things to do. The parent does not really give complicated study or complicated words. And that's what we have in our text, just simple, practical, easy to understand words. So that our response it's not much of a confusion so that we need explanation, but that our response is more of whether we humbly accept it, truly believe it, and willingly submit to it and obey it wholeheartedly since it's the word of the Lord. And so Romans chapter 14, verse 1. Now accept the one who is weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his Opinions. Another translation. Accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. That's the NIV. Now, look at the New Living Translation. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Contemporary English version. Welcome the Lord's followers, even those whose faith is weak. Don't criticize them for having beliefs that are different than yours. We read from the four different translations, at least for us to see, that the instruction is simple and easy to understand. It's simple. It's not complicated. What am I to do? What are you to do with a brother or sister in the Lord who has a difference of opinion or think differently than me over a non-essential or debatable matter? God says, welcome, receive. Again, in NIV it says, accept them. Don't reject them. Welcome them. Receive them. Yes, even in your circle. But not to debate with them. Do not argue about non-essential matters. And don't criticize them. Do not judge them, as in don't be judgmental. It does not mean we cannot exercise discernment, that word judgment, to 
to exercise discernment. That's another meaning of that. But do not judge us and do not condemn or despise them for having a different opinion or view on non-essential matters. The Bible says accept them. It is helpful to know that in this verse, the instruction was given to the strong in faith. The strong, is, the strong in faith is the one who understands that non-essential matters don't affect the spirit or the heart. While the weak in faith thinks that the non-essentials do affect the spirit, the inner person, and therefore may affect eternal destiny. Look at verse 2. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. Now when it says weak in the faith, it doesn't mean that the person is lacking in conviction of God's truth. It doesn't mean that they are morally weak so that they easily fall into temptation and sin. It does not mean that the person loves Jesus less than you do so that they don't stand up for their faith in Christ. But rather, they are weak. They are weak in the faith. The faith. As in the teachings of the Bible. In this case, in this context, the teaching regarding non-essential matters. Their belief in the teaching regarding the non-essential matters is weak. Because it is weakened by their strong opinions or deep-held beliefs that they grew up with, such as traditions. So in this case or context, we can fairly assume that the weak in faith are mostly referring to the Christian Jews. Because of their dietary restrictions, they cannot eat everything, only certain foods. Some resort to only vegetables. And again, because their deep health, because their, their deep health convictions influence from their traditions or views they grew up with. And again... In the modern church, like us, ours, certain food may not be the issue. It may be something else, such as certain type of musical instruments, certain type of songs, certain ways on how to run the church, certain church policies, gifts of the Holy Spirit. People fight about the speaking of tongues. I don't speak in tongues. He speaks in tongues. I don't. In other words, there are people who have strong personal views and restrictions about such matters and they don't want others to observe it. I mean, and they want others rather, they want others to observe it the way they do. Non-essential matters. Otherwise, they become judgmental or critical of others and either exclude those people or individuals or they leave the fellowship. Not understanding that even if they leave the fellowship and go to another church family, that it will be the same situation in other groups. The Bible says in verse 1, accept the person, not reject. Welcome. Receive, include, don't exclude the brother or sister in Christ just because he or she has a different opinion on non-essential matters. Not only are we to accept one another, look at verse 3. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. To look down on someone means to despise. To despise means to disrespect a person. You look down on them as worthless. That's why they're not in your inner circle or group or cliques. Did you know that that is a sin within the body of Christ? If you stick with your cliques and you always have lunch and dinner with the same person? Because the Bible says don't do that. Accept the person. I mean, we're all going to be together in heaven forever in eternity, right? 
Why not start practicing that here? While we are here and learn and grow in the grace. What is grace? Favor that we don't deserve. We received it of God. We received it from God when we don't want to give it to others. We don't want to be judged, but we want to judge others. But we cannot accept judgments from others. And those who are strong in the faith we have, are those who have a better understanding on non-essential matters. Therefore, can eat everything. The verses don't look down on those who are weak in the faith. Those who lack understanding on non-essentials so that they have personal restriction, restrictions. On the other hand, those who are weak in the faith must not judge, meaning condemn those who are strong. In both ways, we are to accept one another, including our differences, our different views. That's not mean not, not necessarily that we agree with one another, but accept. Accept our differences. As others would say, we agree to disagree. Again, that's on matters that are non-essentials or debatable matters. On matters that the Bible gives us freedom to practice and not to, pra and not, uh, to practice or not to practice. Listen, we can have differences on non-essentials. God allows us to have them. Disagreements on non-essentials. He just doesn't want us to argue about them, fight about them, resulting to dividing and separating and then leaving. These are non-essential matters. It's not that they are not important per se. It's that they, they are not critical. They have no eternal bearing or value. Whether you drink a glass of wine or a bottle of beer, The Bible says, do not get drunk. That's the prohibition. That's where the sin comes in. That people fight about these things. You'll be surprised. You go to Germany. They're in the Christian church, and after their fellowship or worship, they go to bars. How are you blessed with the message this morning? Yeah, you know what? They don't get drunk. They know what the Bible says. So accept one another with our non-essential difference. Why? Because look at the last line. What does it say? For God has accepted him. So let us stop judging or condemning, even criticizing one another over non-essentials. Now look at verse 4. Can we read together? Go. Who are you to judge or condemn someone else's servant? Who am I to judge or condemn you? That is not my place. That is not your place to judge or condemn. That belongs to the Lord. When I begin to judge or condemn someone, I'm putting myself in the place that only belongs to the Lord. Therefore, I'm usurping the Lord's title as judge and His authority to judge. I am taking that which belongs only to the Lord and what audacity and how arrogant of me being only a servant to take the place which belongs only to the Lord. Now, I don't want to do that. And I believe and want to believe that neither any of you. For one, our judgment is imperfect because we only see the outward, but God and only God can see the heart. Therefore, we cannot really judge unless we truly know both the facts and what's true. And since we don't know most of the time, let us leave the judgment, the judging or condemning to God. But this we know, that if we are in Christ, God will never condemn us. Right? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
thank and praise the Lord for this verse. And so, if God will not condemn us, why do we condemn others? Why do we despise or disrespect or put down or even exclude a brother or sister in Christ? Maybe because you think they're doing something wrong? According to who? According to you? According to your convictions or your beliefs? Based on what? Is it according or based on the Bible or is it just your personal view? Is the Bible clear about the matter that you are arguing about? Or is it just your understanding that may have been influenced by whatever views you may have besides the Bible? Whatever the case may be, we need to remember Jesus is the judge. I am not the judge. I am not the Lord. I am not the master and neither are any of you. Jesus, he is Lord. He is the judge. So don't be judgmental. Don't be condemning or critical of others. Listen, each one of us will stand before the Lord who is the judge and he will hold each one of us responsible for our own actions. I and only I am accountable to God for my own actions and not you. You and only you are accountable to God for your own actions and not me. One thing for sure, the Lord will help us do what is right. He will enable us by His Holy Spirit and His Word to stand firm in what is right and not fall. Isn't that what? Our text says, for the Lord is able to make him stand. That's verse 4. In the end, it is the Lord who will determine if what you did or what I did is right or wrong. It is the Lord who will determine that. So don't be judgmental of others. Another issue in the early church in Rome was the observance of holy days. Look at verse 5. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Again, for the Jews, there's only one holy day, and that is Sabbath. But for the Gentiles, they don't have a Sabbath. For the, Jew, for the Jews, worship is supposed to be on the Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, Saturday, Sabado, Sabbath. While for Gentiles, it was perfectly okay to worship any day. Now, Sabbath is another subject matter in itself. But just to point out, the Sabbath law was not canceled. We are to observe and obey the Sabbath law, just like the rest of the moral law, the Ten Commandments. That is, we are to observe a day of rest. But the day of worship, why do we worship on Sunday? Because it is the day the Lord Jesus resurrected, which is the first day of the week, Sunday. That is why it's called the Lord's Day. The early church, including the Christian Jews, gathered on the first day of the week to worship and celebrate Jesus and His resurrection. At the same time, the Christian Jews still kept the Sabbath. They set, up, they set the day apart for the purpose of rest. And so should we. But going back to our text, there are those who believe that there is only one day we can worship, while there are those who believe we can worship God in any day. We know and believe we can worship God any day. We can actually meet on Monday nights or Tuesday morning, Wednesday noontime, if we decide to have our worship service on those days, even on Saturday. The question is, would you come? And that's why there are churches that have extra days of worship as long as they have the resources to do so. Nothing in the Bible prohibits them from doing that. But as a church like ours, like in most other churches, we meet on Sundays not only because it's the Lord's Day, but because it is feasible, meaning it is achievable or doable Workable for the most, if not all. Whatever the case, the Bible says, each must be fully convinced in his own mind. Meaning, each one 
must have their own conscience or conviction regarding the essential matters, and each must respond according to their own convictions. Our conscience or conviction or belief is what the Lord uses to warn us and enable us to stand, and ignoring it will lead us to fall. But don't impose your conscience or conviction on others. Don't convict people of sin that the Bible does not call sin. It is the Holy Spirit's job to convict people of sin, not yours, not mine. Remember, we are not the Holy Spirit. So have your own conviction or conscience. And it continues in verse 6 to 9. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord both of both the dead and the living. This is to say that the Lord died not simply to save us from our sins, but that he be the Lord of all. He set us free from the slavery of sin so that we can live as his servants. So now, whatever we do, we do it to honor the Lord and not to please self. We don't do things just for ourselves to gratify self. We live for the Lord. We do things to honor Jesus out of our gratefulness to Him. This is now our motivation in doing things. That whatever we do, we need to make sure that we do it for the glory of God to honor God, to honor the Lord, out of our love and our gratefulness to the Lord and for all that He has done for us. As Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And remember 1 Corinthians chapter 10.31? It says, whether, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Why? Because listen, we are not our own. Remember the Lord redeemed us with His own precious and sinless blood. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. We used to when we were under the sin and the control of sin, but Jesus redeemed us. We're no longer under the slavery of sin and the fulfilling of gratifying ourselves. We're now under the slavery of Jesus, who is holy and good. Slaves of righteousness, as Romans, I mean, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to says, remember, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So he bought us from the slavery of sin and set us free from sin so that we, be, we can become his slaves of righteousness. Romans 6, verse 16 to 18. Don't you realize that you become the slaves of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey his teaching we have given you. Now you are free from slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteousness. And since we are set free to righteousness, we ought to be his people who do what is right. Who do what is right in his eyes. May not be right in other people's eyes. May not be right in their view or their understanding, but in our own conscience or our own conviction, we are right in His eyes, especially when we do things with the sincere motivation of simply honoring the Lord and doing things out of our gratefulness and love for the Lord to worship Him. 
I seriously doubt that a person whose motivation is to honor the Lord and does things out of gratefulness and love for God will be wrong in God's eyes. Want me to repeat that sentence? I seriously doubt that a person whose motivation is to honor the Lord and do things out of love for the Lord, God says, you're wrong. You did not do right. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. So that is our motivation. And I will trust I will trust you that this is your motivation when you do things. Whether you're a ministry leader, a member, whatever you do, not only in the church, but in your daily life. I will trust you that this is your motivation when you do things. But you also need to trust me that this is my motivation as well when I do things. And trust others as well. It is not my place to judge your motivation, neither it is your place to judge my motivation for one Neither of us sees what's hidden in our hearts, only God. You know, I used to do that when I was growing up in high school because we copy what we see and hear from other people and other church members. But then when I read the scripture, it says, you know, why? And still people are still, I question that motivation. The motivation. How, how do you know that's the motivation? Feel kulang. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 to 5. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At the time, each will receive his praise from God. It is the Lord who judges. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. It is the Lord who will do that. And so we're not to do that for judge motivation. For one, we don't know the heart. Secondly, we must not judge people's motivation because we are not the judge. The Lord Jesus, He is the judge. We will all, we, we all are His servants. And so, verse 10 to 12, was the same verse but different translation. Verse 10 to 12. So why do you condemn one another? Why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scripture says, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account of self to God. Listen, don't think and don't act like you are the judge. That's being arrogant. Not only that, that is dishonoring the Lord. It is disrespecting His Lordship. That's thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Remember Romans chapter 12, verse 3? For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. So back to Romans 12, 13. There it is. Don't be judgmental. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle on your brother's way. There it is. Don't be judgmental. That is, let us stop criticizing or condemning or despising others in the church that may not agree with us on non-essential matters. Those matters where we have our own personal views, or our own convictions, or strong opinions, so that we argue and fight and we disrespect and exclude them. Don't do that, or stop doing that. 
The Lord says, accept them, welcome them, receive them. And you might say, some of you might be thinking, that is very difficult, if not challenging and hard. And may I say, of course it is. <laughs> yes, it is. But it is not impossible to do. It is definitely doable. Otherwise, the Lord would have not commanded us to do so. He will be mocking us if that were the case. But the Lord does not do that to us. Church, listen. We can do this and we ought to do this. How? We go back to Romans 12, verse 1. This is how we respond. By the mercies of God, the goodness of God that none of us deserve, we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable act of worship unto God. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may, be pro so may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. In other words, we need to have a biblical perspective. We need to view things biblically, not merely logically or philosophically, worse, emotionally, but simply biblically. And what will help us in, the, when, and what will help us in this process is the humbling of ourselves before God and before one another. When we humble ourselves before the Lord and towards one another, love, which is His love, will flow freely in us and through us. Then we will see the wonderful working of His love in our lives and in the lives of others. We will experience the power of His love that can truly change a heart, change us, our hearts, and we will fulfill the requirements or the moral requirements of His commands or laws. Remember Romans chapter 12, verse 10? Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourself. Chapter 13, verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Verse 10. Love does, not, does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. When this happens, or is happening, then we accomplish what the Lord requires of us. What does the Lord require of us? Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So don't be judgmental. Don't condemn or criticize others because of their different views. They have different convictions. God doesn't condemn them. God doesn't condemn you. God does not condemn us, even now, in relation to the world. Remember John 3, 17? For God did not send His Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. That is where we need to focus our energy on, and not to nitpick on each other, but to make sure that we proclaim the Lord's love that we have received and share that love with one another and the people out there by telling them that God loves them as well. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. How can the people in your family and relatives or friends and in your workplace believe the message of God's love for them when what they hear and see in you is all being critical and judgmental, especially of your church or fellow Christians in your, in your workplace or in school or in your neighborhood or what have you. That's why love is supreme, equal with truth. We don't just do truth, 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 truth. No. What matters is to what? Demonstrate or express the truth in what? In love. That's what Jesus did. The Pharisees were legalistic. They have all the rules but no love. We cannot just have love and no truth. Both. 
is easy to abide by a set of rules. You know what's difficult? To live in love. No wonder. <laughs> Jesus, God says in His Word, you can know all the right things, say all the right things, do all the good things, but without love, you are nothing. And folks, church, brothers and sisters, this is what we need. Especially today, in the times that we live in. We don't need brothers and sisters who police us. But rather, brothers and sisters who will love us and encourage us, help us. If we're doing something wrong that we believe, according to the Bible, strong, we lovingly correct them encourage them and bring them yes we can have differences and live that way we just need to learn to accept and not argue about those things Jesus Christ is coming back soon and we need to be ready and help others to be ready as well let us pray Father in heaven we thank you for your word Help us as we continue in our journey, not only in this letter to the Romans, but even together as brothers and sisters in the Lord in this world. You have brought us together not to fight and argue about our non-essential differences, but to stand together with the truth, which is your truth, your word. And to help one another by building up one another, encouraging one another, praying for one another, serving one another, loving one another. And extending that love to the lost people out there by giving them the truth of the gospel message that is strengthened in the way we live our lives, that is lived in holiness and lived in your love. And so we thank you, we glorify you, even as we continue to worship you through our tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about